Habari Yako. That was me looking at you. Hopefully you did respond because I do remember teaching some of you how to greet in Swahili. If you did not respond or you forgot, here is a recap. I say Habari Yako, you respond Nzuri Sana. Hopefully you can practice that during this time and when we meet, uh, you can greet me in Swahili and I promise I will respond back to you. But I hope you guys are doing good, staying safe out there. Um, hope to see you guys real soon. Have a blessed Sunday. Good morning, church family. Uh, we are grateful that you have tuned in um, to worship alongside us uh, today uh, from your homes. We pray that this would be a ministering time to you, all of you uh, as we remember our God who does great things, has done great things, and uh, will continue to do that. And so uh, may this song be one you can just join in as you uh, get familiar with the words uh, and these truths and sing these out with joy with your families. Thank you. 
the silence, in the waiting, still we can know you are good. All your plans are for your glory. Yes, we can know you are good. Yes, we can know you are good. Lord, I got us ever faithful, never changing through the ages. From the darkness, you will lead us. And forever we will say, You're the Lord our Good morning, church family. Habari Yako. Uh, I'm actually wearing a, a shirt that was given uh, to me by one of the members of our church. And I'm actually thinking this morning in particular about uh, Beth Kalia. Beth, if you're seeing us, uh, we miss you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Beth is in Kenya right now. In fact, she went to visit her family before the pandemic hit and has been unable to uh, to return since then. And so we miss you, Beth. And I just encourage all of our church family to to be uh, thinking and praying for her uh, this morning. You know, it's hard to believe, but it has been seven weeks since we last met together in this building as a church family. It was March 8th, and that was Daylight Savings. 
Uh, some of you are still sleeping in, so that's okay. So for some of us, it's been probably two months or more that we have, have all met here. Uh, this last week, I was interviewed by an AP reporter and asked the question, what was your last good day before the pandemic? My initial thoughts were, wow, that was a long time ago. Uh, for our family, it was our daughter's birthday. Um, Sophia turned uh, 10 the beginning of March, and we uh, celebrated by going to the aquarium and having a meal at one of our favorite Chinese restaurants. Um, my, our last good day for, uh, for us as a church family before the pandemic was that, that gathering on March 8th. And, you know, my second thought when I was asked that question was, there have actually been some really good days since the pandemic. I mean, there's certainly been times where I've wrestled with my thoughts and emotions, I think like many of us have, but there's also been a lot to be grateful for. Um, These last couple of weeks uh, as a church, we've been able to feed close to 300 families to provide food through our drive-through food distribution. Um, There's been some stories that have come out through that and also just through the individuals in our church. And so as difficult as this time has been, God is still at work and still doing things. You know, one of the interesting things uh, about this time is the fact that we're all experiencing something together as a church family. Um, When you think about prior to the pandemic, uh, all of us work different jobs. We all have different family situations. And so when we gather together, we kind of bring all of those things, all the diverse experiences together. But in this time, we are all walking through this same thing together. But not just as a church family, as a nation, we're all walking through this together. Like literally our entire country is experiencing the same thing. And not just as a church or just as a nation, but our whole world is walking through this together. Have you ever thought about that? No matter your religious beliefs or the nationality or ethnicity, the entire world is experiencing this unique time in history together. And this has influenced me uh, in how I'm even approaching God's word uh, in my quiet times and how I'm preparing my messages each week. While we aren't all responding or being affected exactly the same, knowing we are all experiencing something together, for me, only seems to cement the unchanging truths of God's word. But let me give an example of that. Uh, We know there's a biblical value of the sanctity, the sacredness of human life. And it is what is driving the entire globe to take historic measures to save life. The preciousness of life is ancient biblical truth that right now is being held up as a standard for the entire world. And whether people acknowledge it or not, it ties back this sanctity of life to the nature of God himself. Last week, we looked at how one of the key attributes of God is love and how it is his example and demonstration of love that is our standard. This love of God is an unchanging truth that was as transformative and foundational thousands of years ago as it is today. Whether we're in a pandemic or whether we're out of it, whether we're in a time of war or a time of peace, whether our economy is humming or it's on the verge of collapse, the truth of God's love for humanity transcends all of that. And it's an unchanging truth because his love is also unchanging. Last week, we looked at our church mission statement and how it is based on this deep, gritty, sacrificial, unchanging and constant love of God. And so we're going to look at that again this week in the second part of our Love God, Love People Love Our City series. And this mission statement for us to love God, people, and our city, it serves as the compass for our church, pointing us toward the things that really matter. And again, these are things that matter no matter what season we find ourselves in. The foundational scripture passage that influences the first part of our mission statement, to love God, is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And you remember this from last week. Deuteronomy 6 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. What's important to know here is that this instruction to love God is actually part two of our relationship with him. 
Because it's not a relationship that we initiated. It's a relationship God did. Part one of this relationship starts with God. It's God's love for us. Because before you and I were even aware he existed, God loved us. Now, if you're a parent, you know how this works. I didn't until I had my first child. I remember holding my son Jude and looking at him, this little baby, and he had it all, all of my love. And I was so enraptured by him and and so amazed at this life. I loved him so much, and he had no clue who I was. He didn't know I was his dad. He didn't know how to respond in love. He could barely open his eyes. And so our relationship with God is similar to that. God loved us before we ever even knew him, before we ever acknowledged his existence. All of his love was aimed in our direction. So hundreds of years after this command was given to the people of Israel to love God, God himself showed up. Jesus would be love incarnate, love in the flesh. And in Jesus, we would see a tangible demonstration of God's love that changed history. Literally, history today is still measured on the arrival of Christ, of what happened before him and what has happened since that arrival. And we know his arrival, that God in the flesh was so uh, history-changing because it made a way for us to be reunited with God, to know his great love and to see a tangible demonstration of it. The Bible records this interaction that Jesus has when he is here on earth where he reiterates the Deuteronomy passage to love God. But he also attaches another instruction very closely tied to it. And this is where we get the second part of our mission statement, to love people. Let's look at this interaction that Jesus has together. You can find it in Matthew chapter 12, verse 35. And if you have your Bibles, you turn, I encourage you to turn to it. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, one of four accounts of Jesus' life. Matthew 12, 35 says this. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him, this being Jesus, with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love God, love people. That's it. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. No, I'm kidding. Seriously, though, if these were that easy, they wouldn't need to be a command, would they? We wouldn't need to be reminded about it or challenged to do it. But we do. Because the truth is that love takes work. True love is based on unwavering commitment and sacrifice. True love brings with it compassion and kindness and mercy. And these are not easy things to act out and to live out all the time. So the question is, why is loving people so important and so closely tied to the command to love God, the creator of the universe? All of God's creation is important to him. And it's all a reflection of who he is. We see this in the world around us. We just had Earth Day this last week. And this beauty, the the beauty of, of God's creation that is around us is a reflection of his goodness and of his creativity. But it is humans in all of creation that are exceptional. Genesis 127 says that in all of creation, male and female reflect the very image of God. And we know that the original design of God was that we would have a loving relationship with him. Not just as his image bearers, but as his sons and daughters. But the problem is, as soon as sin entered God's good and perfect design, that relationship between humanity and God became broken. God's children were disconnected from him. Still image bearers, still reflecting the attributes of God, the creativity of God, but no longer in that loving relationship. But God wasn't okay with that. Just as quickly as that sin took effect in that relationship, God set into motion the plan to pursue his image bearers. 
And as we looked at last week, this is where love took on flesh, where it was demonstrated in a sacrificial way. You might remember this from last week, 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So we could sum it up this way. You are really important to God. So important that he took on humanity himself, that he suffered and died for your sins so that you could once again be called a son and daughter, be restored to that original creation design. So the first command to love God with all that we are, our heart, our soul, and our mind, is tied into, intimately connected to the second, to love people. And they both require the same thing. In order to love both God and each other, we have to know and receive God's love for us. You you can't give what you haven't received. You can't live out what hasn't been demonstrated for you. And let's be honest, receiving love is sometimes much harder than giving it. There's a war being waged against the love of God, and it has been waged since the beginning of time. On one front of this war, there is such a distortion of love that people don't even know how to define it anymore. It's even gotten to the point that all we can really say in our culture today is, love is love. And on the other front, more and more people wake up in the morning, look in the mirror, and see someone that is unlovable. And they believed a lie, a lie that does not come from God himself. And both of these examples are evidence of the distortion of sin. And this is why Jesus came, so that we might know God and his great love for us. That it might be restored, there will be definition to it, there will be an example of what is true and right. And when we receive what Jesus has done for us in love, it then begins to change us. It begins to shape our affections. Really, it actually begins to give us new affections. So, we love God because he loved us. It's our response to his actions toward us. As my kids got older and they began to understand, oh, this is my father, they began to love me because I had loved them. They had seen it demonstrated. They know what it looked like. And we love people because God loved us. He's our model for that. So when we truly understand both the original design of humanity and the redemptive action of God to restore relationship, we understand that our starting point with each other is the same as God's toward us. And that starting point is love. 1 John 4 continues and it says this, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete in us. Last week I mentioned that loving God is simpler than we might think because it's not based on performance, but relationship. And the picture of life we get that's connected to this great commandment in Deuteronomy 6. The picture is of a life where God and his ways are the center of all that we are, this perfect love, this perfect relationship. When Jesus answers the questions about the greatest commandment, humanity is included in that, to love God and to love each other. And that's pretty amazing when you think about it. It shows God's heart toward us. And in a sense, Jesus is saying, if you really want to demonstrate your love for God, then here's what you do. Love each other. Love people. And remember the love we're talking about here. It's this agape love. This Greek word, which means compassion and favor. And agape, it's it's directional. In other words, you move toward people with 
this love. It's a love that takes initiative. So to the culture that really doesn't know the definition or demonstration of love, we have the ability, we have the opportunity to point them to Jesus' example of this agape love. And to the individual who gets up every morning and feels unlovable, we get to be a tangible demonstration to them of the love of Jesus. When Jesus says all of the law and the commandments hinge on this, to love God and love people, he's saying if you bottled all that up, you shook it together, you compressed it down into one thing, these are the things that matter most. 1A and 1B, love God, love people. So if you're like me, sometimes you look for loopholes in doing what you know you should do. And so we hear this command to love God, to love people. Uh, Luke 10, this account that Jesus has, it says to love neighbor. So they might, we might ask the question, well, what kind of people? Who is my neighbor? There has to be some qualifiers here, right? Like we can't love everybody. And the truth is, it's easy to love people that I like. My wife, my kids, my family, my friends. I mean, you can choose some of that even. But there's limits, right? That was one of the questions posed to Jesus. And in Luke 10, as he's having this interaction with this, uh, with this religious leader, he says, okay, you're saying to love my neighbor, but who is my neighbor? And here's where Jesus tells a, a pretty famous parable. This parable has actually worked its way into our culture and even into our legal system. There is such a thing as the Good Samaritan Law, and it is based on this story that Jesus would give on this Good Samaritan. If you know the story, it's about a man who was going about on his way and he got robbed and beaten and taken all of his possessions away. And three people passed by him. The first person is a priest. The second person is a religious leader. And both of them pass by this Jewish man and pay him no attention. And then a Samaritan comes along. And to understand the weight of this story, you have to understand that a Samaritan and a Jew don't associate with each other. Different ethnicity, different religion, you don't associate with a Samaritan. And this Samaritan reaches down to this man that religious people had passed by, and he helps him. He restores him. He puts him on his own horse. He gives him money. At the end of this story, Jesus asks this religious leader, he says, of these three people, who was the good neighbor? And it was obvious. And Jesus' command is, now go and do likewise. So who is our neighbor? Who do you have a hard time showing kindness and compassion towards? They're your neighbor. If Jesus were to challenge you to love in this same way that he challenged this religious leader, who would he sub in your life for a Samaritan? Would it be somebody of a different political party that you're to love in this way? Would it be somebody of a different ethnicity or nationality? Maybe it's not a type of person even. Maybe Jesus in this story, if he was telling it to you or to me, he would pick out a specific person in your life, one that you can't stand, one that you don't want to associate with or never see again. So the question is, who is my neighbor? Where, what line is there in how I'm to love and who I'm to love? There is a line, right? Well, yes, there is. There is a line. I mean, there are some terrible people out there and it was no different in Jesus' time. There was completely evil people out there. And so Jesus draws this line. And we see it in Matthew 5. And it really connects to the story of the Good Samaritan. Matthew 5, verse 43, says this. Jesus speaking. He says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor, which we just talked about, and hate your enemy. But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you th love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet your, only your own people who are, what are you doing more than others? 
Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So as it relates to our command to love people, we're going to draw the line where Jesus drew it. The people who deserve agape love, they start with your mom and they range to your enemy. All of these people deserve love. That's a challenge, right? So let me clarify again. Agape love does not mean you try to please your enemy. It doesn't mean you take them out on a date or submit to them in some way. Agape means that your posture toward them is like that of the Good Samaritan, that is one of mercy, of kindness, and compassion, even when they've done nothing to deserve it. Because this is just like God's posture toward us has always been. So here's the thing we can't do. With these scriptures or with our mission statement as a church, we can't just put them up on a wall and nod and smile to them. We can't just hear a message about them once in a while and just say, sounds good. We've got to step into them and we've got to live them. I saw this funny kind of illustration this uh, last week uh, from a, a Christian satire uh, website called the Babylon Bee. And they do these fake articles. And the, this particular article said this, study, 84% of Christians show no symptoms of following Jesus. And I laughed and cried at the same time. You know how you get one of those? It's like, oh, that can be so true. And so we can ask ourselves as Christians, what are the symptoms? What are the evidences of belonging to God, of following the ways of Jesus? Again, sometimes it's simpler than we make it, but it's also more challenging than the culture would have us believe. Jesus, in thinking through this question and sharing it with his followers, he says this in John chapter 13. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Ready? Wait for it. If you love one another. People know that we belong to God when we display his agape love. A love that would reach out to those that, man, have done wrong to us. A love that extends mercy and compassion to people that maybe we feel like don't even deserve it. And it is a love that is intentionally directional toward the people that are around us. Let me qualify this, though, with don't be fake and religious with this love. Don't love to make yourself look good. Don't do it to earn God's favor. Do it out of genuine compassion. Do it out of the love that you have received from God. I've seen some pretty simple but powerful demonstrations of this in our church family just in these last weeks. I've seen people make phone calls just to check in on people. What a beautiful picture of love that is. How are you doing? Are you okay? I saw... Uh, I've seen flowers and meals delivered to, to folks without anybody even asking for it. The last two weeks, a number of folks in our church have volunteered their time to serve and distribute food to families in our neighborhood, in our community. These are simple but powerful acts of compassion, of agape love, that display that we are doing our best to follow Jesus in this life. This first John says, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So the love of God that has been given to you, that is in you, it's complete when it's flowing out of you. I think about it in relationship, kind of the, the picture that comes to my mind is this hose that I have in my backyard that's like 50 feet long and I hate it. Because every time I try and go water my garden, no water comes out. And I look down the line of the hose, and sure enough, there's a kink in it. The water's flowing into it, but it's not flowing through it. It's useless. And for those of us that have received the love of God, we need to be an unkinked hose. We need to be conduits of God's love. And I'm going to tell you a little secret here, that when we live in this way toward others, 
God demonstrates his love even more to us. We get fresh love. We get this flowing of his spirit through us. And we know that healthy relationships are ones where love isn't just received, but it's given. And the same is true in our relationship with God. So when you and I love people, we are loving God. And when we love people, we are making God visible to a world that desperately needs to know God's love. So then the question from here is, what do we, what do, we do? How do we respond to this? Is anyone really capable of loving even remotely close to the way that God loves? The answer is yes. Yes. But not on our own power. And so there's three things I want to just leave us with this morning to think about as it relates to how we love people. First, you have to receive it. The only way we can love people like God is commanding us to love is if we've received his love first. Have you? Have you received the love that was displayed on the cross for you when Jesus died for your sins, my sins, so that love might be restored, so that we might be free from sin? Have you received that? And if you have, the second thing is you've got to stay in it. And this is where the Holy Spirit works in us. In Galatians chapter 5, it's talking about the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of the Spirit. And one of those key evidences is this love. But it is God's Spirit that is working in us. We are imperfect. We leak. We're like a hose with a kink and leaks in it. But it is God's Holy Spirit that works through us, that empowers us, that refreshes us. And as we stay connected to Him, then that love begins to work more completely in us. And then the third thing I would challenge us to think about today is that we've got to give it away. We've got to be conduits of love. That's how this love is made complete, as the Bible says. And we need each other for this. Hebrews 10.25 talks about the church being a place where we love each other and we encourage each other to good works and good deeds, to display this love. So we need to do that. When we see a brother and sister not displaying love on the way that they're communicating on social media, we need to lovingly come alongside them and say, hey, that's not quite what we're about as a church family. When there's opportunities to step out, even if it's uncomfortable, we need to, to, to call somebody up and say, hey, I'm having a hard time with this, but will you come with me? We need to serve some people. We need to love some people. We've got to give this love away, but we need each other to do this. And this is the beauty of the church. Even as we're separate, there's still ways for this to happen. And so I want to pray today. I want to pray, first of all, for those that have not received it, that today would be the day that you would consider fully receiving the perfect love of God. And for those of us that have, that we would stay in it and that we would continue to give it away. So let's pray to that end. Lord, I thank you for your love that changed me. And Lord, I pray this morning for those that have not received it. They've looked for love, as the, the song says, in all the wrong places. That they would find the perfect love in you. Your agape, your compassion and kindness and favor. Your unchanging, unwavering love towards us. Your posture of love toward us from the very beginning. That before we even knew you, God, you loved us in this way. And so, Lord, for those that have not received it, may today be the day. May this moment be the moment they say yes. Lord, forgive me for, for rejecting that love, and, and I receive it today. And Lord, for those of us who have received it, but, but we're like a leaky, kinked hose, I pray that you would work in us, Lord. Lord, that we would be conduits of your love, that it would flow through us to the culture and the world around us that desperately needs to know what love really is. And Lord, as a church, that we could display this love, that we could nudge each other where we need to be nudged, that we could say, come on, let's go love some people well. We thank you that it is your spirit that does all of these things. So we just yield to you. We say more of you, less of us, Lord, in this area. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
And just as we've been doing recently with some thoughts as we go, and again, you can find these um, on our website. If you click on the, the main page under resources, we, we continue to just put things on there that can be an encouragement to you in this time while we're apart. And the first question I think we all have to ask ourselves is, um, do you believe that God loves you? Are you that person that stands up in the morning, looks in the mirror and sees somebody who's unlovable, sees all your own flaws? You're believing the lies of the, the, the enemy who has been waging this war from the beginning? Do you believe that God loves you? And I hope the answer to that is yes. But you need to immerse yourself in his word to remind yourself of that. And, and I, for this, I would say, what definitions of love have you accepted that aren't actually love at all? I encourage you to, to read the, the book of 1 John. We've been looking at some of those verses, and especially chapter 4 in these last couple of weeks. And 1 John is really about this demonstration of love and who we are because of God's love, that we're his kids, we're his children, and he loves us like that. And as we see these right definitions of love, we realize that there's a lot of false definitions. And then the last one, how can we encourage each other toward love and good deeds? We need each other. We are imperfect, but, we, but together God does beautiful things. And so we need to encourage each other toward love and our speech and our actions into the things that we do. So my hope for us as a church, that, that means us as individuals and corporately, that this will be a time for us to really grab a hold of the truth of God's word about who we are and about his great love for us. And that the world would be impacted by people who said, let me teach you about Jesus. Let me show you the one who loved me so much and he loves you the same. That's what changes things both in our hearts and in the culture around us pray that you have a great rest of your day with your family there and that the love of God becomes deeper and more present in your life in the days ahead. God bless.